uh, it will be protested in three time zones from uh, after this one. So, mm -hmm. yeah, everything is good. Excellent. And it's live. Hello, everybody. Hello again for this uh, panel on uh, API specifications with uh, two contributors of API specifications and two users of API specifications, uh, book authors, or uh, also at some point uh, contributors, uh, at least on the ideas, right? On the ideas to improve them. Uh, so I'm really glad to have uh, this, uh, the fantastic four. <laughs> uh, maybe we can do a small uh, tour of introductions. Uh, we can begin by uh, maybe Mark, who, who was the keynote speaker yesterday. Thank you. Um, yeah, hi, I'm Mark Rendell. Um, I am the author of GRPC for WCF developers. So um, I've spent much of the last 18 months trying to help people who were using one specification move to a new, better specification um, and creating tooling to, to do that as well. So I've been diving very deeply into the gRPC specifications and, and how all that works and trying to push the people implementing the spec for .NET um, in what I think is the right direction and giving them feedback. So, yeah. Thank you, Mark. And so the last three were speakers in the last hour, but maybe just can you make a quick uh, tour of introduction uh, for people who may join us just right now? Uh, maybe Fran, you can begin. Sure. So my name is Fran Mendez. I'm the author of uh, SNKPA specification and, and SNKPA initiative. And um, yeah, I usually spend uh, my time working on the spec, working on the tooling uh, related to event-driven architectures and uh, and all, you know, all everything related to messaging and APIs. Perfect, uh, Daryl. Hi, uh, my name is Daryl Miller. I work for Microsoft as a program manager. And in my spare time, I am, as Phil described me, a kitten herder in the <laughs> technical steering committee for OpenAPI. So we help to move the open API specification forward. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Daryl and Phil, as the last uh, the last one for our presentation. Yeah, hey, uh, my name is Phil Sturgeon. I um, maintain and edit APIs you and hate .com and uh, do the developer relations for Stoplight. Um, I do a whole bunch of things. More recently, it's kind of building tools that that leverage open API to help with API design. Uh, workflows, um, but I also occasionally dabble with contributing to OpenAPI itself, um, and definitely like experimenting with with early features. So a little bit of both. Yeah, you volunteer so opinions, right, Phil? <laughs> <laughs> I volunteer opinions, absolutely. Whether people ask for them or not. So maybe for the two uh, implementers of specs, right? And and uh, uh, so um, how does how does specification for APIs help you in your everyday work? And what they have enabled for you in your uh, in your yeah uh, workflows and and maybe in your company and collaboration. Yeah. Um, yeah. For me, so um, working with gRPC, um, there's a sort of there's a core team who have been working on this for some time, and they've built implementations on various platforms like C plus plus, Java, Python. Um, but it's an open specification and people working on other platforms, other programming languages are able to create their own implementations of that spec. Um, and you can guarantee, you can know um, safely that you can use the gRPC implementation for any given uh, platform or language, and it will be able to communicate with other gRPC implementations, regardless of what platform they're written on. Um, and Microsoft have uh, recently undertaken a, a big effort to build a completely new implementation of gRPC for .NET Core, um, which runs on top of the .NET Core Kestrel um, services and, and infrastructure. Um, and they've opened up gRPC to people who were building ASP.NET Core APIs. Um, and so they work as part of the gRPC organization on GitHub, 
but contributing their own code. Um, and it meets the spec and you can use a Java client and talk to an ASP.NET Core server or a .NET Core client and talk to a Python server. And um, so, yeah, the specification underneath gRPC makes that possible. Yeah, um, same thing for OpenAPI, really. It's it's quite fantastic that you can um, have one API that's described, uh, that's built in Java that uses annotations uh, and a code-first approach, and then another API that's written in, doesn't even matter, uh, JavaScript that uses design-first, reads the, the OpenAPI files and does server-side validation, and then you can pipe that into some other end-to-end -end testing suite that understands OpenAPI and upload that to AWS Gateway, and that also understands OpenAPI mostly. Um, and theoretically, everything should be compatible. It, it's pretty cool to be able to have all these different tools. And when someone says like, hey, to stop light, do um, SDK generation, we're like, nah, but here's a list of five of them, five other tools you can use. We don't need to, you can just <laughs> use that one. It's quite nice to not have to make everything all the time, just focus on the bits that we're interested in. You know. So uh, for the specs, uh, are they more useful for the code or for the collaboration? I Actually, uh, sorry, no, no, go please, on, please, please. <laughs> go ahead. Um, so I think uh, what I found out is um, it's more about collaboration. So it's more about humans than technology in the end, right? So we we have all these uh, specifications like gRPC, OpenAPI, NCKPI, uh, GraphQL, and of course there is a background. There is a a, a technological background if you want uh, to, to generate code, to generate uh, uh, some artifact. But uh, what I found out is that most people are using it as contracts to avoid human errors and to communicate to other humans, like what's expected, right? So, so it's all about humans in the end. It's not so much about the technology, of course, also the technology. But... I, I think that's the awesome thing, because I think there's been like three there's like three distinct things here and specs are just great for all like like mark and phil were saying disparate platforms can just talk to each other and the spec just disappears in the background as an enabler um i've also used uh writing open api specs just to communicate with devs like we need to build this http api here let's just sketch out what this thing looks like and we don't have to talk about you know, implementation tech, I just get to tell them, this is what I want the API to look like in the end, go away and build it. And I don't really care what tech there's their preferred tech to go build it. But then on the other hand, it's a great tool for communicating between systems also. I mean, that like we, where I work, the APIs I work on, they aren't described using open API, they're described using OData CSDL which sucked because there was a bunch of tooling that I couldn't access that accepted OpenAPI. So we translated it, and now I get to leverage a bunch of that tooling because I could map it to OpenAPI and then do a bunch of client SDK generation uh, because it's just a machine-to-machine -machine translation. So I, I think there's just the value of them is the fact that they just open up so many different possibilities. And so what's the work of contributing or building a spec? How, what, what's the, all the, um, the jobs around it and how do you communicate with the, the community of users? That's a good point. Uh, <laughs> it's always hard. Uh, don't know exactly the how. To me, is it's a lot of listening. It's a lot of uh, not being, being cautious about giving your opinion beforehand. So you don't condition others uh, others' opinion, and it's a lot about listening the community. And uh, the problem is, all, as always, is uh, it's um, and it's not a joke. It's it's a very async job, right? So it's a <laughs> it's a very async job because uh, you might want to work on something now or this week or this month, but uh, yeah, people are don't have time or are not uh, involved 100% or not even a, a small percentage into the initiative. And then it takes time. So uh, to develop a feature, um, it usually takes time. It usually takes, uh, takes a lot of time and a lot of feedback from, from people, right? And, uh, and to me, 
uh, again, uh, I, I would like to reinforce that it's it's a lot about listening and 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 um, yeah, it's talking to many people, even asking many people proactively, like, hey, what's what about this, right? And um, and yeah, so, it's it's great I, I, that you. I'm oh, sorry, go, go down. Just go, Phil. Okay, so it's funny, it's great that you get such Thank positive feedback because I have been keeping an eye on, I, I occasionally contribute to JSON Schema and, and OpenAPI, and th there's always a huge amount of feedback, and, and it always seems very difficult to do the right thing in certain ways. Um, it feels like a lot of people uh, think that um, people working on JSON Schema have never looked at XML Schema, and they're just remaking it as JSON. And then it's, <laughs> <laughs> right, they're like, oh, this, this seems just like XML Schema. They're just copying it. Um, and then other people think that we're moving too quickly. Other people think we're moving too slowly. It, it gets very difficult to, you know, some small features can take a year to get put into open API. Um, and, and then if something changes that somebody doesn't like, they think, oh, they're rushing, changing too much. So I, I don't know how other folks here kind of manage that, uh, that like changing things and user expectations in the specification. It, it's a really tricky balance. I, I think the interesting thing is that the actual process of evolving the spec is itself about managing change. Specs happen because some dev out there has an itch they need to scratch and they come up with some idea and they produce it. Like Swagger was Tony Tam saying, I have a problem and he threw something up and other people liked it and they started using it and it grew from there. And then he was like, oh crap, this thing probably needs to have a spec written <laughs> so Ron wrote a spec and there was a spec created and it grew and it grew. And then it's like, you know, this thing's big enough that it should really be part of a larger organization. And we had verse, pr pulling out version three of the spec. There were like three or four of us that would get together on a Friday and hack through the problem. And we moved forward and we got it out and three went out and all of a sudden there was a lot more interest. And now there was, 10, 12, 14 people in the meetings every week. And it's like, well, now how do we reach consensus? Because before we just used to argue for a while and then Tony would say, shut up, we're doing this. And it was dead <laughs> easy, right? But as it get, grows and as more people get involved and as companies commit to saying, we're taking a dependency on this thing. And then we get to debating, okay, we have a new version and what does it mean to be breaking? And it, you grow up, right? You have to reach a new level of maturity every step of the way. So I don't think the spec definition process is ever the same over the lifetime of it. I think the one thing that, that we should learn is that specs don't evolve from a bunch of megacorps getting together saying, hey, we should define a spec for this, because then we end up with soap again. <laughs> Okay. Um, so, and I'm glad to hear, Mark, that you're solving that problem. <laughs> so, I mean, my um, one experience of working on a specification was Owen um, in .NET, mm. um, which I think Daryl, were you involved with that at all? I, I was. I was a, um, a, a, a observer from the sidelines, a right. spectator. Um, and that, I mean, that was basically .NET's equivalent of Rack or Python's WG, WSGI. Um, yeah. uh, and you would think that's incredibly simple. It's just there's an HTTP request coming in. We're going to represent that somehow. And then it's going to flow back out as an HTTP response. That took us over a year. Um, and it was 0 0.1 and it was 0 0.2. 0 0.4 had the worst <laughs> function declaration um, I have ever written in my entire life. Um, but yeah, it's just, there is so much. And that's for something really, really small and simple. And we eventually got it done. And it's it's formed the basis of much of .NET's web stuff going forward. But um, that's that's a simple little thing. And so these, these larger specifications like OpenAPI, Async API, the gRPC spec, um, it necessarily it has to move slowly. There's there's seven billion, seven and a half billion people out there, and any one of them could decide to pick it up. And so the people who are in charge of these specifications have to account for this is out there and people want to use it. Um, and so we've got to make sure that it does what people need and not push it too far down one path or 
too far down another and try and keep it at a level where it's useful to everybody. Um, and I have a lot of respect for people who do that. I really do. Well, would you say that the specs actually helps companies to adopt, um, let's say, for example, in the API specs, um, APIs in a way that uh, that cost less on the on the operational level, that help that enable more collaboration on a single source of truth. Uh, but on the other side, I would say that most of the successful API companies we know didn't use directly spec; they had internal spec at some point. So, how how uh, do you see uh, like the specs replacing the old best practices of some companies, but to democratize definitely uh, contract-driven development for everybody? I, for example, I've learned that Stripe didn't use any like official spec for a long time; they had their internal stuff, uh, right? Yeah, I mean, think about it like um, strict typed programming languages and, and kind of weak type programming languages. You can make a successful company in either, um, but with a weakly typed language, you're probably going to have to write a whole bunch more tests to make sure that thing actually does what you expect um, versus a, a strictly typed language. Um, might You might be able to get away with a few fewer um, tests. I feel like you can have a REST API that just accepts random JSON, and if you've got a bunch of tests written for it, and you've documented it really well, and you've done all this other stuff, then you're probably going to be fine. Um, but if you uh, if you don't do all that stuff, if you don't have that good kind of workflow, and you don't have those good um, approaches, you you aren't rigorously documenting what you're doing, um, then you get into a bunch of problems. Like my last company, we had 100 APIs. No one knew how any of them worked. None of them were documented at all. Uh, there was no contract testing anywhere. It was all a big old mess. Um, and that company was still pretty successful. <laughs> we work, uh, you know, questionable now, but um, it was doing pretty well at the time. And and so they didn't have any open API stuff. And so we started putting open API in um, purely as a way to kind of add documentation, add contract testing, make sure that, you know, changes weren't breaking clients. Um, and and so that I think reduced a lot of the fires we were having on a regular basis because developers were literally, someone was saying, I need to work on this API. How does it work? No one knows. Look at the code. Ah, it's a mess. No one knows. Uh, we'll just make a new API. And that's wasting so much time and so much money. And it's absolutely ludicrous. And that's not a one-off. That happened a lot. Um, so I, I think, honestly, open API will save you time and money and production outages if you use it well. You don't need to use open API to avoid all those things, but it's it's one way of avoiding those things, right? You could avoid it with other rigorous testing and other rigorous contract testing, but it's it's a good way to have one source of truth that handles all those things, for sure. Yeah. And I don't think there's a major problem with companies having internal formats as long as they have tooling that will translate easily from that internal format to uh, a standardized format, because that's what it's about, right? It's about describing interfaces. So if you can translate um, between them, then then it's going to likely work for you. Because, of course, the challenge is of having a single source of truth is, well, you have the single source of truth for describing the API, but what about like describing the scenarios that were there for why the API exists in the first place, or the end user documentation, or all these other artifacts that go into, you know, the, the what are the, all of the monitoring and rate limiting and SLA type things related there. You know, we can continue to do extensions and pile them all into a doc, but then it just becomes a kitchen sink spec, right? And it, it becomes a challenge. And these are problems that we're trying to figure out what should go into the open API spec and what shouldn't go in. Um, but I, I honestly think we, we kind of need to get to a world kind of like the, you know, the Unix like tool set is we have a lot of focus tools that solve specific problems that all work together. Um, and, and that, to me, seems like the ideal end place to be at. So interoperability so, more than standardization at some point? Well, I mean, you need standardization, but it's just like we don't want to be in the position where it's, oh, I have this Uber spec that solves every problem in the entire API space, and everybody should adopt this Uber spec because then it will solve everybody's problem. Because you know that six months down the road, somebody else is going to come out with an Uber spec, and we're all going to fight over which is the best Uber spec. So I, I also like to uh, notice that... Um, so you, we were comparing here in this question uh, success with specifications, right? 
And I uh, would like to mention that just by using spec doesn't make you successful, right? So you can be a complete disaster even if you are the best one doing specs or using specs. So it's, it's, I don't think it's, it, it, it's at all related. Might be somehow related, of course, that if you care about one thing, you maybe care about the other, but it's not strictly related. And that's the case of Stripe, like you mentioned, right? Uh, so Stripe might not be using the spec. I don't know if they use a, an, an internal spec, but what I see from them is, uh, is a lot of empathy for the user, right? For the developers. Uh, and that's, in my opinion, what makes, uh, what makes them successful uh, with their API um, because of the empathy they demonstrate with uh, creating this really good crafted, well-crafted uh, documentation, right? Um, and again, that and I see people using Open API uh, or, or Async API as well, uh, really well, like very structured, very professionally, and uh, and they're a complete disaster. Uh, <laughs> you know, so. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, yeah. Open API will allow you to define the API pretty much any way you like. You can still define a terrible API exactly. in valid <laughs> Open API, and <laughs> and no one will thank you for it. Um, I think for me, um, and actually this is particularly true with Open API and and HTTP, is um, as a developer. Um, Personally, I'm not great at documenting my code. I'm, I'm not great at writing the documentation. And if you work in a big organization, I've worked for the sort of in the financial sector for places that have got 10,000 developers um, and they're building APIs and they need to consume each other's APIs. And you may get these guys over here have got Atlassian and their, their documentation is in Confluence and these guys are using SharePoint and their documentation's in SharePoint. And these guys have just dumped some stuff into Google Docs and it's there's no sort of consistency to the formatting or anything. And I have always said throughout my career, I wish documentation would compile because then I'd know if I'd done it right. <laughs> and with open API and with these specifications where it says, this is how you lay things out. These are the words that you use. These are the property names and everything else. And um, it it is documentation that compiles um, and it can compile to a server or it can compile to a client library to access the API. And to me, that makes things, um, it makes me feel better about, I have documented this properly. There is enough information there for people to use it um and uh if yeah there's there's probably more information that would be useful um but i certainly mm. uh, I, I think yeah. it's it's 99 percent better than than what would exist if there wasn't something like open api there for me to, to form yeah. my you would have liked you would have liked the talk i gave an hour ago it was that <laughs> I'll, I'll watch it on replay yay yes. <laughs> it, it, it's worth qualifying it it compiles reference documentation but you know the reality is we still need those content writers to write real stuff for humans to really layer on top but absolutely uh, for reference documentation it's absolutely a godsend yeah 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 one question about because you mark and, and Phil, you wrote books about specific uh, um, specifications, right? And, and so uh, on the other side, um, uh, Fran and Daryl, you need people actually to evangelize the, the use of uh, a good use of APIs and the good use of the specs. So what's the relationship, what's the, 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 the good relationship between, uh, let's say the evangelists about technology, right? To write content in book and the contributors, right? Uh, do, do you have any anything, or maybe did you have any contacts writing your book with uh, the contributors? So when I was writing my book, um, I had uh, people from the .NET GP GRPC team were actually reviewing it. Um, and uh, one of my favorite things that happened during that process was um, I had a chapter and I mentioned something you could do with GRPC. And one of the people implementing it for Microsoft went, oh, I didn't know that. Um, so maybe he then went and made sure it worked properly or something, I don't know. Um, but, uh, I, 
I think the people um, who are writing books, who are writing content, who are evangelizing these specifications, one of the things that they're in a very good position to do is to feed back to the people defining or implementing these specifications and say, hey, um, you know, I just described this and as I was describing it, I thought that doesn't sound great. Um, is, is there some way that could be made better and, and so on? Um, yeah, so Mark, I totally feel your pain there. Um, <laughs> I've had the exact same problem. I started writing build APAs, you won't hate number two because everything changed. Right? The version one was 2012, things got a bit different. Um, since then. And so I started writing it and, and and talking about kind of API specifications, I started off kind of talking about API Blueprint and RAML when they're basically gone. So that was kind of useless. And I noticed a few problems with Open API V2 and, and then V3 kind of came out as I was writing about that. So I was like, well, throw that chapter away. And then I noticed some problems with um, JSON schema not quite matching up with Open API. And I was like, right, let's let's see if we can figure that problem out. And then two years later, that got sorted out. Um, <laughs> and I, I feel by like, so I ended up, I started writing a book about how things work. Then I ended up getting involved with um, Open API to try and make things work a little better. And then I ended up getting a job at a tooling vendor to try and make some of the tools work a bit more efficiently. Because <laughs> I'm, I'm the book I would have written would have been ten times longer if I if those tools weren't better and Open API wasn't better. I was like writing, this is how you do it. Oh, this is crap. And yeah, you just get in a wormhole of now I've got a completely different job and hobby. <laughs> yeah, and look out for Phil's next book, How to Shave a Yak. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I don't know much about shaving. <laughs> So one question, uh, um, now Daryl, you wanted something. I was just going to say, uh, when I need to refresh my memory on the parts of the open API spec that I wrote around serializing of parameters, I go read the content that Helen, Helen from SmartBear wrote on, on that particular topic to remind <laughs> myself how it works. Because she did a much better job of explaining than, than I did in the spec. <laughs> Well, that happens very often. Like uh, I, I read what I've written on the spec, and it's like, oh gosh, it's like, well, I don't know what I was thinking here. It's, just, it's impossible to remind. <laughs> so actually, how, how do the spec relate with each other? Uh, I know async API like uh, is in close contact with uh, with Open API. gRPC, I think, is uh, is owned by the cloud, uh, the CNCF, right? The cloud, yes. Uh, the yeah. Cloud Native Computer Foundation, or yeah, I always mix the C's. Uh, and and GraphQL has its own foundation and its own Linux uh, Linux group. So I know at API specification conference you try to gather them all for a discussion, actually doing the work. But um, yeah, uh, what are the bridges that can be found between all the specs uh, on the technical side and on, on the on the on the collaboration collaboration side? So. Uh I think uh, an interesting point for async API here is that, um, for instance, uh, we introduced the, the bindings, the concept of protocol bindings, right? Um, and we faced uh, one challenge with the HTTP protocol binding, and it is that we had to start redefining again what the OpenAPI did already. And it was like, that, that doesn't make sense at all. Like, uh, why am I going to repeat what they did already? So uh, there are parts like this, like the HTTP binding on Async API that uh, we're, we're not actually working these days on that, um, that um, what it's gonna do is, it's gonna allow you to plug uh, a part of an open API document, right? Uh, into the Async API, into your Async API document uh, and making it compatible, right? So we don't have to reinvent the wheel. And it doesn't mean that in our spec, in the Async API spec, it's going to be listed all these uh, fields and all these data, all these details. No, it's it's just like this is the Open API operation object. Go there and see how it grow, how it works. Uh, don't care. We don't define it, right? Uh, it's, it's it's like this. It's like JSON schema, right? So same thing. It's like we have the schemas on the, on Async API, and it's we don't we don't define the schemas. We have some documentation there, but. It's the job of JSON schema to define that. So if you want to learn more uh, of what can you do with this, go to JSON schema. So uh, I, I often feel that um, we're also leaving JSON schema uh, out of the conversation here. It's the one powering uh, in, at least Open API and it's in KPI. It's like, uh, but yes, yeah, so in this case, for instance, to me, this is the 
the first case uh, of uh, how different uh, uh, specifications can interrupt, right? Uh, the JSON schema uh, example. But again, now, like I was mentioning, now the next step for us is interrupting with uh, with OpenAPI, right? So, and, and, and I don't know, for instance, something that we're working on as well, uh, we're gonna be working on as well is uh, on, because uh, we support different uh, schemas, uh, schema languages, not just JSON schema. Some people are asking, uh, why not GraphQL schema, right? Uh, I already I, I don't have a REST API and my uh, and my event driven API. I have a GraphQL API and my event driven APIs. So I have them all already defined in GraphQL schema format. I don't want to redefine them using JSON schema, uh, right? Because it's it would be stupid, right? So we will have to integrate at some point with uh, the GraphQL uh, specification, right? So it's possible to embed it into the uh, in, embed it or link it somehow. Uh, from async API, so that's to me that's uh, to me that's the the, the 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 best way for the developer to have everything in a single place, uh, but lever leveraging the the um, the rest of the specs without having async API to reinvent the wheel over and over because that would be stupid, right? So and, and it, it might be. It, it might it might be good for my ego, <laughs> right? Like, uh, yeah, we have uh, the the spec of the specs. Uh, no, I don't care. I don't. Uh, but the but the the developer is gonna be like, I don't care about your ego. I just want it to work, and I have a, I want to keep using Open API. I don't want to replace it with async API or with or with GraphQL because I have this service here, this product here that works perfectly with Open API. I have this other one here that works with GraphQL. And I have this other one that supports us in KPI. I want to use the three of them, right? And it's your problem to interrupt, not my problem, right? So, so yeah, um, that's. Uh, and, and we are largely the same, and especially like with Open API three one, we finally taken the last steps we needed to take. Thanks, Phil, by the way, for pushing that for so long. Uh, that we can use real JSON schema within uh, Open API as opposed to almost but not quite Jason schema um, and we're we've actively been working on this notion of alternative schema too so that if you have a non Jason payload like for example proto buff uh, you could point yeah. to a proto schema um, and if somebody has an API and they have a GraphQL endpoint then point to a GraphQL schema for that GraphQL endpoint also. Um, and we, we need as community people to divide and conquer because a lot of us do a lot of this like in our spare time or just kind of as well as the rest of our job that our bosses hand down to us. Mm -hmm. And it just makes no sense for us to be continuously reinventing the wheel. We have to build on top of what each other is building. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah on, on the now on the on Phil and Mark side, uh, as, uh, as you are... Uh, tool, you are developers and also building tools for developers, how important for you is a well-governed uh, uh, um, uh, specification and, and what, what makes you really trust about the team into, into uh, building a specification that will last? Um, I mean, for me, building visual recode and, and having to work a lot with, um, with gRPC spec I have to trust you know I'm, I'm investing a lot of time and effort in this and I would really like it to still work next week um, and the grPC um, you can see all the the conversation that happens around how it's going to develop um, happens in the open it sort of it landed fully formed from Google but since then it has been developed in the open people push it in different directions there's a lot of um, a lot of stuff going on there, um, <clears throat> and uh, yeah, um, and it's you know governed by the CNCF now, um, and that keeps it your back. Well done, um, and so yeah, you have you have a certain amount of faith that there's enough stuff out there using this specification and and making money using this specification that um, they're not going to tear it all up and and start again and, and break things. Um, but it is, uh, if it wasn't 
at that level of governance and openness, then I wouldn't feel comfortable investing that much time and effort in, in working with it. And I think that is important with, with all of these specifications is you have to have that trust in the, uh, in the governing body or the, the people behind it to mm. look after it and do the right thing. Yeah, absolutely. And if you don't have a huge amount of trust, you can always get in there and keep an eye on them. Um, one thing I love about OpenAPI is that they have, uh, uh, it's very open, funnily enough. There's the TSC Technical Steering Committee. Uh, you can just get in there and, and chat with them. And it's surprisingly fun, actually, uh, a bunch of pranksters in there. But um, yeah, when new features are being discussed, a lot of the time, um, I, I feel like maybe back in the day, things were kind of discussed and maybe done a bit on Slack and then back on Zoom and then back on Slack and then kind of the end result was written down. But now um, since uh, I think, Daryl, you came up with the proposals uh, proposal where basically things have to go through, um, they have to be put into OpenAPI as a proposal with a with a like experimental extension, um, kind of like, you know, CSS browser, browser prefixes and stuff like that. Uh, and people can kind of try working with them and try building tooling around that to see how well it works. And if it works out, it'll make it into a later version. And if it doesn't work, it won't or it will get feedback and then um, go into another version. And, and I think that stuff's really important because you, it's this really weird chicken and egg situation where like no one's going to implement a feature. Um, the standards bodies don't want to put features into the, they don't want to uh, like finalize features that haven't been tested, but no one wants to work on features um, before they know if they're going to be finalized or not. So you get into this weird, like, no, you do it. No, you do it. And, and vendors, <laughs> vendors are waiting for standardization and it just, it doesn't work. So um, something I like about Stoplight is that we have um, dedicated a little bit of time to, to try implementing certain features. So when alternative schemas was coming up, we, we spent a bunch of time, we hashed out, a bun uh, we hashed out the ideas and thought about how we'd actually go about implementing that and started doing some proof of concepts. And we very quickly found out that it wasn't going to work very well in the, in the condition it was in. Um, and then we ended up kind of pursuing the proper JSON schema approach instead of alternative schemas. And so um, I think that it's, it's a symbiotic relationship. We, we need the standards people to be listening to the feedback of tooling vendors and tooling vendors need to be prepared to actually work on that stuff. But you don't want uh, like a finished product to be dropped on your lap and then you find out it's crap and then you wait a year for a new version um, because that's just a lot of wasted time, especially if you if the tooling vendors spent a bunch of time implementing that feature and found out it was crap. You've just wasted a bunch of time that you could have spent working on other features or other bug requests or other stuff in general. So, And that's significant for us because we don't have the notion of reference implementations. If we actually built reference implementations, then we could go off and implement the things that we have uh, were trying out but we don't have the, the, the capacity to do that, the resources to do it. So we're reliant on the community going and actually building stuff. And mm -hmm. so this is why uh, we got into this chicken and egg problem that Phil was talking about. We actually do it uh, at Async API. We do have this reference implementation. Mm -hmm. uh, we neither have the capacity to do it, but we, we do it. <laughs> but, <laughs> And uh, yes, uh, at least a reference implementation, even if it's in a single language, uh, just as a way to try it and, and try the idea behind it, uh, that works. So that, that has worked a lot uh, better than uh, relying on, uh, on community exclusively because, um, yeah, we, we quickly found out what was working and what wasn't. And now we are already discussing what needs to be fixed on the next major version because we found out while writing the parsers and writing some tooling, right? So, so yeah. Yeah, we had a question uh, that you answered, Daryl, but maybe it's good to see it on stage. Like, what's the most important uh, thing you've learned that everybody contributing to spec or building spec actually should know? Hmm. So, so, so the quickly the two comments that I made is is and it relates very much to this conversation we just had. You have to have people committed to building the stuff you are planning to put in the spec. There is zero point specking stuff out that nobody's going to build tooling for. Uh, it just makes the spec more complicated and everybody unhappy. Um, so that's the first thing. The second thing is I think your org kind of needs to nominate somebody as a benevolent dictator. 
other you will spend a ridiculous amount of time just bike shedding on decisions because everybody wants to make everybody happy and nobody wants to the, the, there ends up with a situation where you just don't go forward because everybody's really good at coming up with problems, but not everybody's as good at coming up with solutions to those problems. <laughs> so sooner or later, somebody's got to go, oh, well, yeah, I see some people don't like this, but let's just move forward. Right. Uh, and we have uh, a, a system of nominated and elected TSC members that have uh, a vote and every well we've only had to do it once and f ironically we had to do it about versioning um <laughs> and uh but you, you need to do it or you just yeah. won't go anywhere yeah now, that's true that, and that's actually something that we are uh, as as we are maturing as an organization ourselves as well as um, i cannot be this benevolent dictator for everything because uh it's 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 impossible to scale basically and that takes a lot of time for me and it, it will be just a a management work in the end so uh and i feel that i can contribute to the spec in, in many other different or to the initiative in many other different ways not just uh deciding what happens or, or what we do all the time right so uh, an, another way that we're discussing to avoid this problem is uh having like a uh, second committee of people if you want um, that uses uh, that is comprised by a uh, an odd, no odd number of people, right? Like one, three, five. Uh, so whenever uh, you get blocked after uh, X time, not just uh, because people ask ask for your vote, but when something gets blocked uh, and can people cannot decide at, after X time, like I don't know, imagine six months. I'm just inventing the the time. Uh, then this committee will jump in and, and vote and uh, whatever it is like Daryl will say uh, it's like instead of a be benevolent dictator it's like a benevolent uh, dictator committee mm -hmm. <laughs> right so it's like uh, they will decide so it's so this is actually like uh, splitting the dictator in many in many people <laughs> so, so, so you can yeah but at the some path. point you got to put your foot and say okay we have to take this to a vote exactly right. Exactly. So, so that's my point. So you, you can. So you can. Um, so the idea is is that these committees don't usually uh, intervene, right? Is is the it's it's only for uh, very uh, edge cases, edge situations, right? Uh, and to me, I think this could work, right? This could work because yeah, like like Daryl said, these endless discussions go nowhere, and nobody gets a benefit from these endless discussions. Yeah, that's a great idea. It's very similar to the open API approach. Uh, instead of having you, you have a um, a odd number of people, uh, open API just has a number of odd people. And that's the, the slight difference. <laughs> <laughs> One thing I think is is interesting in this sort of managing specifications is it's done um, on GitHub these days. And I think that's made a huge difference to, you know, not that long ago, specifications nobody knew where they came from they they just landed and you and uh, you, you're like okay that's it I'll, I'll deal with that um and now um i mean i'm looking at the async api repo on github and there are pull requests and so if people think hey this would be a good change then they can open a pull request and other people can review yeah. that and can fiddle with it and comment on it um and it's just yeah it's, it's very interesting that the same tool that developers are using to build code collaboratively is being used to build these other things collaboratively as well. And yeah. it means you don't necessarily have to let everybody contribute to every conversation. Um, you can lock it to just contributors if you don't want to have all the noise of people complaining at you. Um, but equally, if you have something where you're looking for external input, you can say, hey, if you've got something to say, chip in and say it. Um, I think that's that's enabled some uh, big changes in the way these specs actually happen. Yeah, some of the older. Oh, sorry. I was going to say some of the older conversations are just like 
you Google around and you find a Google group that refers to an old mailing list entry on some like backup archive server because the original one's gone away. And the decision uh, refers to a conversation that was had at some like local meetup where they just decided it all in person. And you're trying to like find out how this decision was made and there's no insight. And now, yeah, like a lot of things with Open API, for example, there is a Zoom call. I think they might be recorded. Um, yep. But then, you know, decisions are recorded and minutes are taken and it's like pretty legit. And, and most of that stuff's done on GitHub. And I think that's the, the, the way forward is like, keeping this stuff open so anyone can get involved and, um, and, and share their opinions if they're interested, you know. Yeah, an open and transparent process to ensure trust into the, the spec. And also following what you said about benevolent dictator versus designed by committee, we should have a uh, you know, a small a small tag say, hey, this spec is designed by committee or this spec is designed by benevolent dictator, <laughs> you know, <laughs> so you know actually where you're going. So for the last last five minutes, maybe can we wrap up like each of us about one main idea that you want to share that maybe we did not we did not address yet. Uh, we can begin by uh, yeah by Mark. Um, so uh, I feel slightly like the odd one out because. Um, you know, Open API and Async API um, and JSON schema, these are very kind of open and there's lots of input from lots of places. Um, gRPC is gRPC, it's its own thing and it works incredibly well for what it does. Um, and, um, but one of the things that I have learned from gRPC and the upfront definition of your interface and your messages and your contracts is the value of that in all technology stacks. And so I've become a much more enthusiastic user of open API and JSON schema for building HTTP APIs because of my experience with gRPC and because of my experience thinking about the interface separately from writing the code to implement the interface. Um, and so I think that's that's possibly the most valuable thing from these specifications is breaking that step out where you think about how something's going to look, how it's going to um, be exposed to people to consume separately from how am I going to implement this in C Sharp or Java or JavaScript or whatever language I'm going to, to implement it in. Um, and you make better decisions that way. So that's my, um, my main argument now for these kinds of specifications. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Maybe, uh, Fran, you want to say something? Sure. And last, uh, comment? sure. So I, I would like to repeat um, um, a topic or, or, or some that uh, was brought up uh, at a panel that Matt McLarty organized uh, it, in San Jose, like, I don't know, like three or four years ago, I don't remember. And it's still a valid point, in my opinion, is don't forget that we are in a very niche market. Uh, so for us, everything is specs, everything is APIs, but the reality is that most of the developers don't care about it, don't use it, and uh, and they're not even willing or thinking to do it. So, and I think at, at that time, the conversation was about microservices, like, yeah, it was cool and all, all of that. And, and uh, but the, the same applies, right? That, um, let's not forget that uh, because we come to you know to API days. So what what can you expect is people interested in APIs, but uh, the engineering or the developer um, world, let's say, is much more broad, and uh, and they are the ones implementing and and also deciding how to code, how to de design some APIs, and they don't uh, even want or don't have a clue about open APIs and KPI and, and, and all these specifications, right? So, so yeah, let's keep an eye open uh, in regards to this, that we should probably be reaching a wider audience. And, uh, and, 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 and yeah, let, it's pretty much this, like we should try to um, make the, the API enthusiastic people or community wider, uh, either by including more more people or are just uh, ourselves going to different events that are not related to APIs at all. So we uh, we spread the word, right? Because uh, I think it's a, especially the concepts around design first, I found it 
I found them really interesting or spec first. Um, really interesting and many people don't even uh, haven't even thought about it right and that's uh, that's what i found in my experience uh, we we have to change that yeah, this is why we the api days and and with the api, API specification conference we try to spread the word thank you yeah. to, for being part of it maybe phil last word uh yeah it's it's a good point actually i did a little twitter poll a while ago and it was like do you do design first um entirely code first um, are you migrating from code first to design first or some other awkward combination? And it was like 20%, 20%, 20%, 35% for awkward combination. <laughs> awkward combination wins um, out of hundreds of people. And I, I forgot to even ask the question, like, you know, do you even worry about uh, writing down the contract at any point? Because it could just be code, not code first, but just code, right? Like, I missed that off the, uh, off the equation. Um, yeah, as an extension of, of uh, what Mark said, um, I... I I, over the last couple of years and since I wrote the first book and, and you know, over time have got more uh, into design first just purely because, um, like he said, thinking about it means that you have, you know, everyone's planning it, whether you're writing it on a napkin or, or writing it down in a Word doc or wherever you plan it, you're, you're still thinking about it. But creating this contract allows you to do mocks and, and see your documentation in a really nice way that helps you think about how this is going to work and interact with a fake one. But it, it also, like, as I just did in my talk, it means that you can you can create style guides that automatically check those designs as people are writing them, as they're planning them, as they're sending pull requests for new APIs or new functionality for old APIs. And, and you can like automate, hey, that's a bad idea. Don't do that. That'll give you a security hole. Don't do that. You know, and you can kind of help guide people on bad stuff. So instead of me turning up at day one on a new job and just shoving my book down everyone's throat, I can implement a style guide that will help us like easily navigate a, a bunch of easily avoidable problems just by like giving them tips on the APIs that they're designing. And I think that's a much nicer way to approach that for everyone than just like buy a hundred copies of my book immediately. Um, <laughs> Although that's good too. <laughs> yes. But if they're going to hire me, that's, that's probably fine, isn't it? <laughs> and, and last but not least, Daryl. Okay. I'm going to use a platitude. Use the right tool for the right job. GRPC, Async API, GraphQL, Open API, they all have their sweet spots. Learn where their strengths are and where their weaknesses are. Use the right tool for the job and let's all build tooling that will take advantage of all of them. Yeah, I think we all well, agree with that. Yeah, it was, it was really great to have uh, uh, you all in, uh, in a panel uh, that will be uh, uh, recorded and replayed for people who could not attend because it was late. Uh, in Europe, at least, and in APAC region too. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. And uh, again, um, for you can find uh, more infos about everybody's project. Uh, Fran about AsyncAPI.com. Uh, Mark Randall about Visual Recode, right? Uh, Phil Sturgeon about uh, the fame, the great Slack uh, um, channel he owns. Well, he owns. Yeah, he he enabled, uh, which is the API you won't hate Slack, and also Stoplight, the company he works for. Um, and uh, Daryl Miller, uh, you know, as a Open API initiative and Open API specification. So, if you want to contribute to their project, or uh, you know, learn, learn more about how uh, you can use what they built, don't hesitate. Thank you all. Thank you very much. You can set the camera and enjoy a good day or a good night now. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you for having me. Thanks for inviting. Thanks, Thanks Maddie. Bye. Yeah, you can type actually the link into the chat, like Fran did. Please. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, there is something. <laughs> Bye. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Daryl. Okay. Thank you. Bye. So uh, we'll finish. I'll, I'll make a quick presentation of uh, just a, just a call to action uh, from the industry, just to say that uh, the industry is uh, is ready, is actually ready. Uh, but before, just so you know, that the, for the one who are still there, really the community members, uh, you can if you go in the networking uh, section, so you will meet people at random. That's also uh, what we call discovery, right? Uh, people discovery, uh, and, and and so if you find the Darth Vader person, right? Because it's at random, so it's like a, a chat roulette, but for API people and for API attendees. If you find the Darth Vader, you would be able to participate to raffle for a brand new Apple Watch uh, there. So it's uh, uh, it may be funny. Uh, you just click on, on networking and you begin to uh, to talk to people. And when you find Darth Vader, you are, you will be one of the few uh, of the 
the uh, the lottery for the uh, Apple Watch. So don't hesitate. I will just uh, share uh, a presentation uh, uh, right now, just to finish, that I call uh, the API industry is is ready. So I will share my screen because now I know where it is after all this stuff, right? I share my entire screen, right? I will share. And you will be able to see my slide. Yep, awesome. So my talk is about the API industry is ready. Uh, so and I will, I will share with you um, like how, if you're a vendor, if you're a company, if you're an API champion in a company, you can actually um, uh, uh, share your trust into the industry uh, to others uh, based on the on the, on the tool we, we, we developed. And uh, yeah, so this tool is the API landscape. It's the 500 plus API tool, API and tooling companies, right? It relates approximately uh, every companies or every project uh, that helps you to build APIs and to achieve, um, uh, let's say your, your API journey, right? So we will discover this all together, but, and I will try to tell you how you can use it to convince your the manager sponsor that actually the API industry is ready with all the tools which are well-funded with companies which are reliable and that delivers uh, great products about the fact that, yeah, it's possible, it's safe, uh, and there are more and more tools to actually support any API journey right now. So the first one, this slide is really about what I call the full API, API strategy mindset. Uh, the main idea, on a, if you have to talk to a C-level, the main idea is really to say, look, we have, it's like a big production process. Uh, we have uh, the third-party APIs we may use, in, that we integrate in our production system, digital production system. We have our internal APIs, the internal services and microservice, microservices that talk to each other through APIs, uh, right? That enable to uh, increase the uh, the reuse across the company, uh, increase the agility, also the for, for the business to be able to understand what the IT is producing. And you have the open APIs, right? To partners for B2B, uh, a relationship for innovation and sometimes for uh, compliance uh, there. So, so I think with just that you can explain to any C level uh, actually what's why why uh, there is a huge interest to have APIs uh, uh, an API strategy uh, for third parties for internal and for open uh, and how they can relate to their existing um, uh, industry process or or business process. So like this, the, the, the role of IT is also invented, in, reinvented, so it's mostly for CIOs. So just to say that before like, before the API era, right, the role really of the company was to control corporate data and to build enterprise applications, right? So that was mainly his two roles with the set of technologies, uh, uh, ERPs, EAI, uh, ESBs, right? But yeah, mainly the role was that, but now with APIs, the role has, is kind of, there are new jobs to be done which is defining the policies for data use and building and maintaining API. So you will build the building bricks that enable to build then the enterprise application yourself or let the other build third-party applications based on the bricks you have built internally. So, so uh, yeah, because the C-level, the executive needs to be onboarded, of course, uh, about uh, uh, their, uh, uh, about understanding why APIs are, are a game changer, definitely in a company strategy. So also just want to say in the industry, there is a lot of consolidation in the recent years. There's many, many acquisitions, uh, many software vendor who acquired other software vendors to complement their uh, uh, API offer. Uh, so you can see Broadcom acquired CA technology that, ha that has acquired previously Layer 7, RuneScope and others. Google acquired Apigee who acquired other companies. IBM acquired Red Hat who had acquired 3Scale before. Right, and you can you can go on 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 many parts of the of the landscape. But yes, just to say, there is a lot of consolidation. So it means that many many vendors are actually uh, like uh, concentrating a lot of value into the same product, right? And so that's uh, that's really inspiring uh, for uh, big companies, big companies who wants to trust big brands uh, about software, so they can uh, invest into uh, into APIs. Also, the market is already established. Actually, uh, yeah, there is a lot of movement. There is new business concepts like API first business. So it's not just API first architecture, but now it's instead of building the final application that will have maybe 20 services is that you build each service, you put an API on it and you expose the API already to partners. So, 
So you are able to deliver uh, value before the final application, right? Before the final application, you already sell or expose the bricks of the application. So it's like API first architecture, but now with the business context, you have API as a product, thinking API as a product. You have the microservice, the, the uh, service meshes and all stuff like that. You have new IT concepts, right? As I was saying, the IT like API first architecture, experience APIs, API facades, right? So many, many new concepts also that uh, that enable, that show that the industry is really vibrant. You have new technologies and specification that we were talking. Uh, uh, now you have a lot of cyber security challenges. You have new uh, regulation actually that oblige companies to open APIs like PSD2 for banking or GDPR for personal data, uh, HI7 and FIRE for uh, healthcare, for example. You have new industries that needs a lot of, that demands APIs. So where it's almost a mandate sometimes, where uh, if, in, if it's not about regulation. And you have also a lot of open source tools that enable to, uh, to make this happen. So we will concentrate in this API landscape into the below part, which is really the tooling. The upper part is mostly about what I call the API as a product, which is just APIs as a standalone product that you can integrate. Actually, there are a lot more than this on an API as a product, but we cannot put them all on the map. But the tooling really kind of respect almost uh, what the industry is going on. If you see that they're missing some companies, right? It's an ongoing process. Don't hesitate. If you can go, I will show you the website, but you can go and contribute to add uh, uh, any company that you think deserves to be in a specific section. Yeah, this is API tooling. So again, uh, why I wanted to talk about this after the talks on the spec, because the specs actually, and especially the open API specification enabled a huge generation of tooling to happen because of the fact that APIs can and are machine readable, uh, right? There's a lot of workflows and I really thank good API uh, consulting company to, to do that, uh, uh, to deliver that, um, uh, I will just disable uh, my uh, <laughs> uh, uh, screen saver. Uh, no, <clears throat> a lot of there's a lot of workflows that actually enabled because of the specifications, right? So now tools know that we can we will have uh, described APIs and so we can build software that will use these machine readable definitions, whatever on the mocking services, the documentation, the developer portal, the monitoring, and and others. So that's really. Uh, useful and because of this specification, we have this huge ecosystem that was able to happen. So if we go back on the landscape, this is a little bit what he looks like in terms of what they're what they all looks like. So you have API as a product, and then you have all these different sections, right? Uh, about like yeah, what are the different companies uh, uh, there, and we will try to explore that uh, uh, together. So there is a new API lifecycle management stack that we'll try to uh, to share with you today and try to inspire your uh, uh, your decision makers about, yes, this is ready. Even if you're a huge company and you want to scale across a, a huge number of employees and, and, and partners, actually, it, uh, yeah, it's possible. So uh, I we often, uh, in the book, I co-authored with uh, uh, my fellow uh, uh, partners of the time, which is Ronnie Mitra, Mike Amundsen, and Eric Vilda. We had these 10 pillars of API management, right? Which is strategy, design, documentation, development, testing, deployment, security, monitoring, discovery, and change. So that was uh, like the, uh, the really the, the 10 pillars of the API program. So you may invest different uh, uh, on different resources on different parts of the, the pillars, depending on the maturity of your program, but still, it will still uh, um, be based on these on, the, on these ten pillars, and we will try to see one and one, and where in the landscape you should find the tools that are existing on the market that can help you. So the first one is strategy. So you know the strategy is really this quote like don't think what is the best business model for your APIs, but what are the best APIs for your business model. So that's really the idea of the API strategy. Uh, there, uh, how I can align my APIs with my company. Uh, and maybe I will find new business model for my APIs, but maybe my APIs will be here just to support my existing business models. If I'm a bank, maybe my open banking strategy will be just be here to support uh, registering more accounts, uh, uh, selling more mortgage or uh, giving more loans, right? So that's really the idea that needs to be, to be there. And, and, and yes, so you have different strategy. The API can be the product. The, can, the API can support a product. The, can, the API can promote the product in terms of media 
or the API can feed the product, in, for example, in terms of social networks. And so uh, also, if sometimes, as John Musser did this in 2013, and that is still relevant today, uh, there's many, many business models attached to APIs, which are sometimes the free one, the developer pays, right, uh, to access because it's valuable resource. The developer gets paid because actually you get revenues on it. I know, for example, a European bank who are paying developers for new account registrations. So some developers could actually earn quite good money uh, uh, because they were enabling the banks to register new customers. Or you can have indirect revenues based on other type of monetization, but yeah. So strategy is extremely important. And in strategy, you can have different part of the landscape. But here I present like where some API management vendors, some API strategy consulting, and some IPaaS integration and, and other, uh, let's say, uh, regulatory APIs are actually part of the strategy. So you can find there the companies that can help you to find and build your strategy either to fulfill it with a, or with a, a product. So the second part of the API program is really the design aspect. Uh, the design aspect and the design aspect is, I love this quote from Aaron and Lore, which is uh, the four level of design, right? So are my API consistent with themselves, right? Across all the endpoints and methods. Are all the API consistent with other existing APIs of the company? Right? Are, are my API consistent with other APIs of the, in, of the same industry, right? And the final level is that are my API consistent with global common practices and conventions? So when you will design your APIs, you will be sure that you design toward usage to, uh, to enable people to use capabilities before just designing towards actually what's in the system, right? APIs are interfaces. They represent the data or they represent the service, but they are not the data, they're not the service. But you need to be sure that they are consistent with everything. And so you will need to think about the API guidelines. What are the protocols, the format, the vocabularies? that actually you need to share across the organization and, and that makes your kind of a development contract. And so you can see on apistylebook.com an example of open source guidelines there that you can actually uh, uh, be inspired by. And so there you can find there are two sections about API specs and again, API lifecycle management tools that may enable, uh, that enables you to think about your, uh, your, design, your design aspects uh, there. The third pillar is documentation, right? And I love this quote about documentation, uh, right? Uh, so push, if that doesn't work, pull. If that doesn't work either, that because we're closed. So, you know, push and pull are actually the first part of documentation. You know, uh, yeah, when the system is not easy to understand, you have to document it sometimes, right? But let's say specifically on API documentation, I love to uh, share it into two uh, sections about the tell, don't teach and the teach, don't tell approach, right? So the tell, don't teach is really about just tell what's 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 here, right? What's the minimum viable documentation? It's, it's going to be API reference, some general concept, security design, some change log, just tell what's there, don't teach others to do. It's a little bit like a, 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 a box of Legos without instructions, right? So, you know, people, if they know what they want to do, if they understand how it works, they will build what they want to do. You have the second part, which is the teach, don't tell, right? So at some point, it's more, more advanced, uh, use cases or when you really know what people want to do, right? Uh, so it's really about the tutorials, the sample code ready to copy and paste, the sample applications, right? Where the workflows, you know exactly what people are doing. That's a little bit like a Star Wars Lego box, right? Where actually you, you have the instructions and you have all the pieces to build exactly what's on the box, right? And so you have to manage the people who already know what they want with the Star Wars Lego box with instructions. And you have also to manage the people who have more imagination that you have to give them all the uh, documentation elements to be sure that they will be able to build anything they want without being restricted by just the path you offer. So you have to manage both on, on both sides. And so like this, you will be able to achieve like beautiful, uh, you know, well-described uh, documentation, which, which is interactive with uh, uh, code samples that uh, automatically are generated depending on programming language. Right, so yeah, documentation has been has been a lot of effort in the last ten years, and you can find also some API documentation tools into this section here, or uh, into API docs section, or into API management also. Who have uh, vendors who have uh, uh, some of documentation uh, part, right? The API program. Then you have a uh, development, uh, the development aspect. I would just 
skip it because there are many, many open source framework for developing APIs, depending on many programming languages to say, but you can find the API specification that help you to develop APIs according to what we call contract driven development in a sense that yeah, you will use the specification to as a single source of truth for developing uh, your APIs. But again, if I had to put all the open source framework for each programming language, it would have been uh, complicated, but yeah, I wanted like actionable direct tools uh uh there that 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 show trust into into the industry so yeah but development is also an aspect and again you can see development is is about a lot lot of aspects uh, uh of of the api life cycle so actually there is a little bit of development in all the tooling part but uh, uh yeah let's uh, uh let's keep that for now the testing so uh you know the api layer testing so you can do virtualization you can do a test-driven development. There are many, many strategy for testing APIs. I often like this one, which is really, the API test is really about the unit test, right? The uh, testing at the smallest uh, unit possible, uh, and also the future integration test and UI test. So the API test is really about being sure actually what your API delivers uh, uh, is what you expect, and being sure that uh, when things don't work, you have the right errors uh, coming, right? And so in this pyramid of testing, the idea is that uh, the more you test on the below, on the lower phase, you make the higher uh, layer more predictable, right? So if you, your unit tests are great, then your API test can be perfect because if something is wrong, you know it's from, it's from you know it's, 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 it comes from the API test and not the unit test. If your API tests are great, when you go to integration testing, if something is wrong, you know it's integration testing is not the below layers and again, finish on the, on the UI test. So there is a specific section, right, uh, on API testing. So companies that just do really well API testing, API virtualization, API mockups, uh, right uh, there. Even if sometimes you can find them on some API management uh, vendors. Then the deployment aspect. Uh, uh, so the deployment, uh, you can find many deployment options into API management uh, lifecycle uh, tools, but also there are some already like uh, backend ready to uh, uh, ready to use uh, as a service. Uh, or platform as a service or backend as a service that you can find into backend tools, uh, mobile backend as a service or GraphQL backend as a service that you can find into the landscape too. If you really want to don't manage the deployment, don't man and have every API in an on no ops manner, you can you can go there uh, to find the tools that make it ready to go uh, 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 fast. On security, uh, which is a really important aspect, there are many many. Uh, you think about security, and, and I love this quote that uh, security was too important 20 years ago to let other do it for you, and now security in too, it's too much important to to do it yourself, uh, right? So a lot of vendors, a lot of threats are actually uh, uh, like uh, unmanageable for on, uh, only one company. So a lot of uh, vendors have actually uh, it's their job actually to be sure that all the threats are actually uh, included into uh, uh, the threat management is included into the software. So uh, so yeah, so that's that's the idea. And, and now with OAuth, with OpenID Connect, with uh, financial grade APIs, with uh, uh, different types of tokens, there is now some artificial intelligence that comes into the game about analyzing API traffic. Uh, yeah, the, let's say the industry has matured a lot uh, to be sure that they can do API security better than you can do yourself. And you can find them into either the access level and identity management space and the API management uh, space. It's important to notice that the IAM, the I, um, identity and access management, and the API management are kind of almost uh, trying to, uh, they, they, they begin to merge with each other, right? So uh, some uh, identity and access management goes more into kind of API management. And the same for API management, they kind of go a little bit to identity and access management. So. So these two parts may merge soon uh, at some point, but they're still separated uh, for now. On the monitoring, uh, uh, again, there is we have a specific API monitoring section because some companies just do API monitoring uh, as, as one uh, feature, feature company. And again, some vendors uh, on API management have, have some monitoring tools, but it's important to notice that sometimes you can find on the market better API monitoring tools uh, than you can have in your API management vendor that, that maybe your CIO have chosen, which is not uh, the best on, it, let's say, API monitoring. So uh, that's that's really the idea uh, there. 
on discovery, uh, on discovery. So there are many ways to discover. So there you have the API as a product part, which is uh, actually finding API in Google mainly, uh, right? Or word of mouth. Uh, that's the way you can discover APIs who do uh, one business process. Uh, there is also the developer portal section. So some companies just do developer portals. And that's also a good way to discover APIs, right? On a specific individual way, or maybe with a small, sometimes a search engine with uh, keywords, but you can find uh, 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 APIs on a developer portal. You can expose them, make them discoverable through developer portals. Another way to make the API discoverable is about the integration platform as a service integration. Uh, so some vendors have a huge iPaaS uh, where they have hundreds of APIs inside or sometimes thousands, and you can find them uh, into the same, let's say, environment that that's consistent. So you can uh, you can also use these tools uh, for finding APIs that may be relevant for for your business. Also, one thing: uh, so some APIs, uh, because they're uh, actually Google opened a little bit uh, some uh, the specs about using how you can use JSON LD to actually make your API discoverable directly in the search engine. So just that's an example of implementation with the Arab Bank developer portal, where actually you can discover the APIs directly inside the search engine. So uh, when you, the developer portal actually, uh, you can find the account information API, the payment API, geolocalization, uh, geolocation. So, so you can actually discover what are the APIs on the portal directly in the search engine, right? So I think it can be a really a, a part of the future of API discovery. Uh, there, because you will be able to, in the search engine, find uh, what uh, uh, what what the platform delivers instead of having to click and and to try to find yourself uh, there. So I hope uh, Google will open it uh, more and more uh, API providers will contribute to that. The last one is change. How do you manage change in API versioning? So uh, it's a mix between API governance tools that you can find in in, in the section, uh, API management tooling that has also some change management and API testing with, because with virtualization and mocking, it's part of the versioning uh, aspect. So you can find everything you need for, uh, um, uh, for, or for that aspect. So uh, yeah, you can, you can go there and, uh, and, and find the tools that, that relates to you. Right. So uh, that was the message I wanted to share with you today is that the API industry is ready. Uh, so you can use that landscape internally if you need to convince some, uh, executive sponsors or some CIOs or some uh, head of architecture or product manager, you decide. Uh, but the fact that, yeah, uh, there is a huge ecosystem of tooling. There have been billions and, 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 and dozens of billions of dollars that have been invested into building these companies and these tools. Uh, you can definitely uh, uh, rely on them. And, uh, and yes, yeah, some great, great companies are have uh, I've trusted them and they're, and they're working. So, uh, yeah, if at some point, when company is hesitating to go uh, uh, to go there, uh, you can definitely uh, say to them that yeah, it's 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 ready. And imp uh, one thing also is that uh, yeah, there is also a lot of open source. Uh, there is an open source API stack that can be great to kickstart your API journey. Uh, sometimes, so yeah, uh, you can you can find uh, uh, this on the on the on the landscape. Thank you very much. That was all for me that I wanted to share with you uh, today. And uh, I think it, it will be time to wrap up uh, to wrap up the, uh, the event. So uh, to finish, to finish uh, these two days together, uh, actually, um, what we can say? So someone will win uh, uh, um, uh, an Apple Watch because he would have found Darth Vader on the networking session. So don't hesitate. Darth Vader is still there. You can still go in the networking session to find uh, Darth Vader. The second thing, so the, all the videos are recorded. Right? All the videos are recorded, uh, and there will be replays in an APAC time zone, at least at, actually in one hour and a half, uh, right? And there will be replay in European time zone in like eight hours from now. Uh, I, I would like to thank all the speakers uh, who found the screen sharing button, but also all the speakers that, that contributed uh, to make that, that event uh, um, uh, a successful event. All the attendees by registering, asking the questions, answering the polls, uh, networking with each other. All the sponsors, because without the sponsors, this event would not have been possible and would not have been free. And so it's thanks to the sponsor that we have made it uh, available 
uh, to uh, the 3,000 re registrants across th three uh, uh, time zones. Uh, so we really, really want to thank the sponsors uh, there. Um, you um, you can also find everything what we do on epidays.io uh, or, or epidays.co, uh, and you can find all our initiatives, our next events. So if you want to speak at API Days, it's possible. Uh, we accept all type of speakers um, um, and also first time speakers, right? Uh, so don't hesitate if you feel you deserve to say something. If you know someone who did something great or who has some knowledge, but doesn't is not is hesitating because of so many reasons, uh, uh, and and you want to you, you know you can uh, uh, push them into uh, into um, into presenting for showcasing their work or their knowledge because they deserve it. Don't hesitate. You can go on EPI Days website and there is a CFP, and so you can share the link uh, to others or use it for yourself if you want to if you want to be uh, uh, one of the speaker. We have uh, nine events a year in nine different regions. They will all be digi digital this year. Uh, so yeah, it's the best time ever to present without the hassle of traveling, uh, without paying the flight tickets, paying the hotel, the expensive hotels, conference hotels, right? So it's now or never uh, for our first talk. So don't don't uh, hesitate uh, uh, for that. I would like also to thank all the APIs team uh, that was supporting and powering uh, all the event. Uh, 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 Baptiste, Uri, Denis, uh, and all the volunteers, uh, Sofia, uh, Olivia, and others uh, that that enable to handle the backstage because you don't see, but we are approximately like four, between ten and fourteen, depending on the moment, uh, to handle the backstage to be sure that that everything works. Also, all the track moderators who are members of the community that really contributed, uh, you know, to host the speakers and make make things happen. Uh, uh, there is so uh, Jesse from GraphCMS, uh, uh, Ross Garrett. And all the other uh, track moderators that were there. Uh, I think it's time uh, to close the event. Uh, we will see at our next event, 27th and 28th of July, for APIs New York, where actually APIs New York will be about financial services and insurance. And we will be glad to see you there uh, for uh, for another APIs events and another great moment of sharing uh, um, with the community. Uh, maintain yourself. Uh, be safe. And uh, uh, and yes, hope to see you uh, at an, another APIs event, online or offline, when all this situation will be solved. Thank you. Have a nice day where you are, and uh, and and yes, see you next time. Bye.